Wednesday, everybody. Welcome back to the Couchside Judges. I'm Scott Fontana. Follow me on Twitter at Scott underscore Fontana. And I'm Dan Urban. Follow me at the Dan Urban. Follow the podcast at Couchside Judges and subscribe to us wherever you listen. And if you like this show, give us that five star review you've been waiting to give. I know it's in you. And as always, we talk MMA judging, so you should head over to abcboxing.com to read the scoring criteria. Well, Dan, it's uh, it's a day late. Unfortunately, uh, you had to decide that you were going on a Vegas trip this weekend, and you didn't you didn't go when there were fights in Vegas, except for the Canelo fight, which you what, did you even think about going to, or are you not going to do that? I was looking for free tickets, but I couldn't find them. Oh. You should have looked on the ground somewhere. Didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. Uh, but you know what? It's not just you and me this time. The extra day, extra persons joining us uh, this time. And we have none other than MMA Junkies, Matthew Wells. Matt, it is such a pleasure to get you on this show. You and I have known each other a few years now, and and uh, it's a real treat. So welcome aboard. Hey, man. Thanks for the invite. I'm glad to join you guys on this show. Do you? Looking forward to it. So your your official title is assistant managing editor. So what what do you do at Junkie now? So like like obviously I think it's like it's kind of a team effort kind of thing with a lot of stuff, right? Yeah, it is. It really is. Uh, majority of my day is spent editing articles. I'll write a bunch of stuff as well, and hand got my hand in video and social and all that good stuff. A lot of decision making stuff too. So do really do a little bit of everything. I mean, I spent the past three weeks covering PFL in person because it was here in DFW. So you know, oh, there you go. Do a little bit of. of all of this stuff. <laughs> what is what is the PFL experience like live? It's actually so like for me, considering like how I how I known it to be covered in past events, like working with, you know, Danny Segura, who always goes out to the shows in Florida. From what I gathered from his coverage, it was different this time around. Like they made some changes this season. So like I know in years past, it seemed like it was more of a free for all kind of do what you want kind of thing while you're there. This time it was more buttoned up. It felt like more like a UFC show. They had us corralled to certain areas couldn't go here couldn't go there they were real buttoned up about stuff so i liked it it was nice though like the presentation and stuff was pretty cool um in person improved the pacing yes the improved pacing was there there were still some awkward moments though where it's like you know they got the guys like the fight ends and then they have the guys holding hands in the middle of the ring for (laughs) like a commercial break that still (laughs) happens so but yeah overall the pacing has improved so I, i thought it was a pretty cool uh pretty cool improvement to see well, to be fair, uh, in the most recent one, it was the prelims were just all decisions, right? So they don't have to worry about pacing when literally every fight's back to back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that that made it smoother for at least for me handling work. You know, I didn't have to worry about rushing through stuff because they were quick to bring people back. Like after the fights for the post fight scrums, mm-hmm. they were pretty quick with it. It was like they hit medicals, boom, hit us in the media room, and then they were gone. Excellent, excellent. I'm glad you got to do that. Obviously, it doesn't always come around to your area, and and lately in Texas, it's like UFC has been going to Houston instead of really anywhere else. Uh, except, I guess they're going to Austin soon. Yeah, doing Austin soon, and the rumor is UFC 277 is going to be in Dallas. So, at least to get something closer by than Houston. Literally anywhere but Houston would be better from a judging perspective because the Houston particular judges are just terrible. Dude. Tell me about it. It's it's always something crazy. Like, I mean, oh, I scored that fight for uh for Dominic Reyes against <laughs> John Jones. You know, particular. I did too. I did too. <laughs> but like you know what? We've looked at that fight a few times and and the way that kind of fight played out, we don't want to spend too much on this. We, we gotta get into a bunch of stuff too. But that fight, it was like Reyes definitely won the first. The second was like, you know, he probably won. It was pretty clear. Second or third round, it's like okay, now we're getting into like the toss up territory. Then John starts taking over, and then by the fifth round, it was definitely John. Yeah, and then like you know, if you wanted to go either way on that, that's fine. Um, but that wasn't even the most egregious scoring that night. I believe nope. Lauren Murphy took one from Andrea Lee, if I recall, that would be in the correct fight. But yeah, there were a co- there were a couple of decisions that night that was just really bad. The Trevin Giles one stands out too. Trevin Giles and uh, uh, James Krause. Yeah. Yeah. And the weird I, thing I with that, that well. the weird thing with that was, and Aaron Bronstetter uh, reported that one, that uh, one of the judges, Joel Solis, he uh, had ties essentially mm-hmm. to one of the coaches for yes. uh, Trevin Giles. So it looked even worse. Uh, it was it was a really bad situation. He has not judged UFC since, by the way. All right. So you know, why don't we just dive in? We've got a lot to cover here in this show, Dan. So, uh, you know what? We should even start with, with Matt on this one. Charles Oliveira. Everyone's talking about, you know, 
Is he the goat? Everyone likes that conversation, right? I'm tired of the goat conversation. Yeah, you roll your eyes. Exactly. That's exactly what you should do. But what I think is an interesting question, though, is, is this the best lightweight run in UFC history? Because it's a little different than a goat. We're not talking about the goat. We're just saying, is this particular run he's on the most impressive in UFC history at lightweight? What do you think? Oh, man, it's a, it's so hard to say that it's like the top because he's not undefeated, right? I mean, when you've got Habib out there who finished his career undefeated, I mean, outside of the T-Bow thing, but you know, it's, it's weird because he's, he's a guy that's been around for so long and he's evolved literally in in front of our eyes and he's now hit this stride where he just seems untouchable. You know, it's just, it's incredible that the, the, the spot that he's in now, I don't think many people would have ever predicted like four or five years ago. Sure. Sure. But like, but in particular, especially this last, like, let's say these last four or five fights, right? Kevin Lee or, 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 uh, or Tony Ferguson, even just going back to that, like this four or five fight run, where does that rank for you, man? It's definitely up there. I would, I would put him, I would put him in top five for sure. I, I'm not sure who I would round out in my top five. I know, right? But <laughs> Habib, and, <laughs> Habib and Charles Oliveira for sure in that top five. Um, I'm not sure who would all round it out, but man, like I said, he is he is doing incredible things right now, and and I love to see it, man, because for a guy that's been around for so long, to finally hit that stride, and it's just been going through it, you know. A guy that seemed like so many times he would get there and then just like, I'm eh, just not quite ready yet or whatever the case may be. But it, it's incredible, man. He's I'm sure we'll get to it at some point when we actually, you know, talk about the fights later on. But he's the fact that he's just this guy where you can't go anywhere like with him inside the cage because he's going to he's going to walk you down. And then if you tag him, he's going to play this possum game to where like, all right, I'm going to go to the ground now and let's see if you follow me and fall for this. We maybe, did that twice. With, with maybe AGI maybe he's <laughs> never actually been rocked. Maybe he's just messing with everyone. <laughs> Good, exactly. Right. My... See, I, I think that definitely happened in that first knockdown mm-hmm. in the, in the Gaethje fight. The second one, I think stung him a little bit more, but I think he still did the, did the little possum game. I think that. Okay. But what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with it? Like, you, are you going <laughs> to follow know. him down there? Like, come on, come on. It's true. You can't, you it's can't true. do that. You're playing with fire. Oh, definitely. No matter where you are, really. What do you think, Dan? What, what about this run? 11 straight. It's uh, That's impressive. Habib was 13 straight. It was. So It's true. Uh, I, I was thinking more in, in lines of titles because no one in the lightweight division has won or defended the belt more than three times. He's only at two. So BJ, Frankie, Habib, Benson, they all, those just three defenses each. Mm-hmm. So... And I count this as a defense. I mean, that weight miss it. That's the that's whole. True. This whole yeah. thing is crazy <laughs> with the scale. I, I don't know what's going on. And half a, half a pound. I don't understand why. You know, I don't understand weigh-ins to begin with. But that's another conversation. That is a whole other conversation. Uh, yeah. But yeah, he's it's really impressive. I'm I'm excited to see where he goes from here. If he beats Makachev, if that's the fight they actually do next, I'd I'd probably put him up there. Uh, yeah, that would make the a best, lot of sense. Best run. I think you're right. Uh. So what about, like, what's your preferred next title fight for him? Because obviously, yes, he doesn't technically have the title, but we all know what he is, right? He's the champion. He is the yes. best in the world. That is who Charles Oliveira is. Who is the next preferred title fight that you'd like to see him in? Uh, Matt, start with you. I want to say Islam Makachev. I want to say that. You know, to be honest with you, I'm not going to be too big. Like, obviously, when a guy like Michael Chandler, who's, you know, hovering around the top ever since he's you know literally came into the ufc it seems like they want to put him in these spots right and especially you have the knockout of the year of tony ferguson a guy who's never been finished before seems like that should be a performance that gets you into another title shot right and he's got some dana white privilege (laughs) (laughs) definitely has that definitely has that and i mean the guy kills it on the mic too i'm a i'm a fan of what everything he does inside the cage um but Islam, man, is just on that, another type of Charles Oliveira type of run where he's just steamrolling guys. He's not fighting the same level of competition as Michael Chandler, but he needs his shot. I think it's his time to get his shot. Um, and Michael Chandler, I, I like him to do other things. He can he can still hang around that top. Welcome Connor back. That's cool. I love that idea. That would be a fun fight. But uh, for me, if if you want Charles Oliveira to I quote unquote win his title back, yeah, <laughs> I guess do it. Let's do it against Islam. Yeah, I'm with you, uh, Dan. Do you agree? Yeah, I want I want it to be Islam. It seems like Dana White wanted Makachev Dariush to still happen, but then he said he was open to you know letting Makachev just skip that and go straight against Oliveira. So I I don't see the point in it at this point. I I think I think we realistically everybody is looking at okay, Islam is definitely the toughest guy who's on the best run going right now that hasn't had a shot. 
I think it's time for a new challenger. I'm I'm with you guys. I, I think this is it would be disappointing for me at least if that wasn't actually it. But depending on who they get, I mean, there's almost no wrong answers at lightweight. You're always gonna get fun fights. Um what about Gaethje though? Like where does he go from here, Dan? I don't know. Uh he's gonna be in a fun fight no matter who you put him against. I'd I'd be down to watch him fight anybody. If they want to do Poye again, or if they want to do uh put him against Dariush or put him against uh uh Connor, uh I don't think you can go wrong with Justin Gaethje. It's true. There so. really are no wrong answers uh, with him, but I think I'm leaning towards Poirier myself. I, I think it, it's okay to do a rematch at this point, and, and that would there'd be some really serious implications there because really whoever kind of comes out of that fight stays in the picture for the title. Whoever loses it, I mean, not that you have to write them off necessarily. I hate doing that, but it makes it a lot tougher for them to get back to that that top of the mountain that they're still trying to climb to. What do you think, Matt? I'm I'm kind of aligned with you guys, and I mean, there's also still that wild card of Nate Diaz out there, right? Who's he gonna fight when he comes back for this supposed last fight? So there's a lot of fun options out there. Um, and like you said, I don't think you can do any wrong. You know, if they do it, do end up going, you know, Charles Oliveira, Islam, do do Gaethje and and Darius. That that's a huge step. Darius wins that fight, then a lot of people are really kind of see him as that championship sort of contender, right? Sure. You know, even though even though Justin, you know. Kind of faltered in in big spots, but still, that's the type of win right there that will really convince really convince you with the casuals. I think. Yeah, I'm, and you know it's funny. Like you you mentioned, obviously, kind of faltering in the big spots. I feel like sometimes that's like a narrative that gets like kind of wrongly attached. And I'm not saying you're doing that here, but but at the very least, Justin Gaethje. I mean, he won the interim belt. Interim belt is what it is, right? But. It's still that was a big fight. That that was a really meaningful fight. I, I think that's one thing I definitely wouldn't knock him for. And again, I'm not saying that's what you're saying, but um No, yeah. I mean, listen, you're fighting the best in the world, Habib. I mean, yeah. My thing was that I think more people expected more out of him in that fight than what we got. Um sure. same with the Oliveira fight. I mean, that fight was a barn burner from go. Like Charles clipped him right off the bat and then it was just on. So Yeah. Just wild wildness and i mean that's what you expect in a justin gagey fight is wildness yes you so, do we got we got our money's worth in that right <laughs> yeah for sure mm. uh we did not get our money's worth though in <laughs> the other title fight uh carlos barza of course getting the win over rose nami Yunus in, in a fight that i watched back again uh before this podcast and literally laughed out loud halfway through the first round because you're just watching them move around and no one has touched anyone uh, and we'll we'll touch more on this round in just a little bit, but you know, let's start with you, Matt. Too has there ever been a worse? Let, and when I say modern UFC championship fight, I'm talking about like maybe you know since we moved away from the no holds barred stuff, right into kind of the modern mixed martial arts era, right? Has there been a worse UFC championship fight than this fight? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, <laughs> Izzy and Romero was close. Did you guys see the uh, Izzy reaction on YouTube? He was sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he literally fell asleep in this fight. No, but so it was funny. a long blink, right? Yeah, a very long blink. Oh, <laughs> uh, no. That was hilarious. And then I went back and watched some clips of the <laughs> Romero and Izzy fight, and I'm like, yeah, it's not much better. No, there's that staring contest in the first round. They're <laughs> just standing there. And then one point, uh, what is it, Yoel just, like, jumps? Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. Strange. After literally strange spinning, he was, like, standing still for, like, 10 seconds at a time, not moving. At the yeah, very yeah, least, though. Bad. At the very least, though, Matt, that fight had, like, there's some danger to it. I mean, Yoel had kind of some, he landed a couple, like, big shots in there. And obviously, at some point, Izzy did something, you know? Yeah. His leg was chewed up in that fight. It's true. It's true. So, yeah. There was, there was some action in there just a little bit. It took a while to get the, there. But this one really didn't happen. <laughs> the, the difference, I think, in that fight and this fight, is I think this fight ha had a lot of timidity where that fight I don't think really did. Where yeah, I think they were, these, these two were, like, actually kind of scared to engage i think it was Man, more rose I think, was, I think it was part of like you know rose's game plan of not wanting to you know let carla feel comfortable shooting for takedowns which i get but at some point you gotta be like look i can rose is good on the ground like she she can wrap people up in submissions it, like that was crazy to me like she, she wasn't comfortable letting her hands go more just completely like evading like there were times where she stepped all the way back like a good like as far as she could go mm -hmm. like what are you like why are you escaping so far away like you're in no danger right now like why are you completely going across the other cage side of the cage to reset it didn't make any sense to me 
And then worse, it was mind blowing. Then worse was after the fight too, guys. When she was at the um, at the press conference and talking about how defense, how people weren't recognizing her defense, and that you know she should win the fight. We all know here, you you us three here know that defense is not in the criteria. It is its own reward. You don't actually score for defense. There was a time, way long time ago, way before her time in the sport. That actually defense counted. It's been a very long time. That's not there. Uh, but she, she doesn't seem to understand or her corner or whoever doesn't seem to understand that you win fights by affecting you know, effective strikes and effective grappling. And there really wasn't like any of that from Rose. It sounded, like probably the whole fight, just like a couple punches, right? Yeah, right. It was, it was so strange, man. It was so strange. And I think part of the thing, like for me at least, is like I could – understand that game plan and i can understand that approach from rose especially because we've seen her drop yoana out of nowhere we've seen her head kick you know waylee jang out of nowhere and the fight's over so like me at least watching it in the moment i'm like okay she can still she can still spark her out of nowhere right right she but didn't that throw... moment never came <laughs> she didn't throw so a weird. single head kick till like the fifth round and it was it was yeah. like half effort at that it seemed like she was very much in her own head in this one, and I, it, that's what it kind of looks like to me. I don't know if that's how it was. I don't want to assign that to her, but just as an observer, that's really what it looked like. Uh, Dan, can you think of anything worse than this, title fight-wise? Really? No. I, I Not off the top. I tried thinking about things that I really don't know. The, the only one that even, other than, um, and, and that was a good call-out on, on uh, Romero and Adesanya, but another one I thought of, and it's still not worse than this, was uh, Valentina Shevchenko. And Liz Carmouche from a few years ago. That was that was one where only one was trying to tango, uh, and that made it a tough fight. But I I still think there was there was more effort on the part of at least one of these women to try and get things done, and and that was of course the champion Valentina Shevchenko was doing some work in there. It just it didn't lead to a very interesting fight. But this was distinctly worse, I think, by levels, right? Oh yeah, title fight wise for sure. I mean, I guess you can always call Caleb Starnes and Nate Quarry. Well, yeah, that's not a title fight, though. So no, no, and I watched that one again recently, uh, and it is it is quite hilarious at the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, and last last on the UFC because we we really got to get to these rounds, but I, and I, there is a little bit of PFL Bellator stuff we got to touch on. But Michael Chandler, uh, we already mentioned Michael Chandler in here. Who makes sense? Uh, most sense, I guess we should say for Michael Chandler next. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Connor on that one, right. just because I think it's a it's one of those fights where both guys. I think are very so so well liked that a lot of fans will want to see that. Um, they're both guys that know how to promote a fight, say the right things on the mic to get people in, interested. So that one makes the most sense for me. It'll be a fun one too. I I I'd be yeah. down for that. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, Connor Connor makes sense. That would be a lot of fun. I I will also wouldn't mind if uh, they moved Chandler into the Dariush fight and just bumped Makachev up for the title fight. The thing I see that makes sense from the UFC's perspective, too, is that if for some reason Connor comes in there and he beats Michael Chandler, they can justify just putting him in the next title fight if they want to. It's Even if they easier. do it at 70? Yep. You know you know how they do things. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Bad. Like it's, it's not sport. It's entertainment at that point. There's there's like a sport division and then there's a, an entertainment division. And you kind of just choose which one they feel like doing at the time. Uh, maybe they haven't done a sport in a while. Maybe they haven't done an entertainment in a while. That's how it like looks, right? Does does this make any sense, or am I just you know talking out of my butt here, Matt? No, it makes perfect sense. We see that all the time. Like, I mean, it, even in that though, those are kind of intertwined. When you hear Connor's name still being thrown in, in title talks, mm -hmm. like after losing so many fights, yeah. So, but yeah, it, it's definitely you know what can I sell pay per view wise? Which fight will sell biggest at pay per view? Title does it make sense for the division or not? We're going to put it together for the UFC. It's all about the dollar first. Then we'll do what makes sense merit wise after that. And without any laws in place to, you know, assure of that any sort of Muhammad Ali like act in place, there's no reason for them to do anything different than look out for capitalism. I get it. It's it's unfortunate, but it's the way it is. Uh, real quick before we get into these rounds and stuff, because we do have a lot. We have like 12 rounds because the judges uh, were they had they had a lot of close rounds first, but they also had a lot of rounds, which is my goodness. Um, Bellator and PFL were both on Friday. And meanwhile, everyone's everyone on those social media, especially, is freaking out over Charles Oliveira missing weight. So there's they've got some fights going on in Paris at Bellator, and all we're doing is talking about Michael, you know, uh, Charles Oliveira losing weight or missing weight. What what is my question is why is it worthwhile or is it worthwhile to hold a Bellator or a PFL event the day before a big UFC or, or is, is there a better alternative or what? What do you think, Dan? 
I think they'd be better suited to, you know, have their own day. Say Thursdays. No one's no one's doing MMA on Thursday. There's no WWE or or uh, AEW to compete with. No other leagues. That's what I would do. Yeah, I think Wednesday's a good day for PFL. I, I really do because they they started on Wednesday this year. The first one was Wednesday. Then they moved to Thursday the next week, and then they moved to Friday. A consistent day is like imperative. But I think Wednesday is a real special day because. You know, us us who've been watching the sport a long time, we used to watch UFCs on Wednesdays. That was something we were accustomed to. You know, they had those fight nights, or it would be like the you know the the one that would lead into the Ultimate Fighter episode that started the season, the season premiere, <laughs> as it's called because I can't speak. And <laughs> um, in yeah. that perfect world, yeah, I w- I would do fight nights on Wednesdays, PFL Thursday, Bellator Friday. UFC pay per views on Saturdays. I also like that. I you know, but but yeah, that's even, good. yeah it, we can dream a little bit here. We can have some <laughs> fun. Uh, I don't mind Bellator on Friday nights. I actually think of Bellator as like a good Friday night thing. It's always been Friday. It's that's what Friday, it feels like. Sometimes yeah. they're Saturday, but like if you put Bellator the day before a UFC pay per view, you're just you're asking for it to get lost in the shuffle. I mean, yeah, this is actually real. I'm I'm really interested in what Matt's going to say here because obviously you know I cover the sport. For the New York Post, it's it's a little more macro. Uh, MMA Junkie covers everything. It's, everything is important to you guys. So, like, what do you think of when you see on the schedule coming up? You got two you Bellator and PFL one day, and then UFC, a big UFC the next day. What, what comes through your guys' minds? Uh, it's just chaos, for one, because, like you said, we have so much stuff. We have media days from every event that we have to worry about. And writing up all those articles, throwing all those videos on YouTube, it's a lot of content. And as we're building the schedule, you know, for coverage on all this stuff, we just we're kind of laughing because we're like, there's so much stuff that's going to get buried this week. Mm-hmm. You know, so much stuff like it could be the greatest interview in the world that somebody gives at media day. Nobody's going to care because why? There's 30 other interviews going on. And then, oh, before that interview can even pick up steam, there's fights to worry about. So it's just constant stream of stuff. Like from a fan's perspective, I think it's kind of cool. To have all of the promotions going on one week, although I think ideally they should try to avoid running up against each other just so you can have, you know, more eyeballs on your product in in particular. Because like I said, stuff gets buried, stuff gets overlooked. But, you know, if you're just sitting at home watching stuff, I think it's kind of cool because Friday night I can plan to sit around and watch fights. Saturday night I can watch fights, you know, just back to back. But ideally you got to split it up, try to avoid each other as much as possible. I mean, I completely agree, and especially if they're international, like Bellator was, put them on in Paris, which, you know, obviously, Paris is a great place to go for fights now. They're trying to grow the sport there, and, and Bellator got the, got in there before UFC did. That's something they can always hold over them, um, it's a few times, actually. But if that's going on, uh, and I think it kicked off the Showtime portion of it at, like, 4 o'clock Eastern times. That's how, 3 o'clock for you, Central, uh, Matt? Is that right? I think that was right. Yeah. Sounds so, correct, yeah. so it's at one o'clock in California, right? Who's who's taking their lunch break to start watching Strike Force or excuse, Strike Force <laughs> Showtime for Bellator? When you, it's the middle of a work day, like not everyone could do this. You're limiting your audience here. It just doesn't make any sense. Put that one on a Saturday and put it on a non UFC Saturday, or at least on a Fight Night Saturday. Yeah. I mean, I guess actually Bellator ended up kind of lucking out because. That main event was terrible. It was a terrible <laughs> so, main event. So, so not too many people, you know, had kind of like that thing where it was just like, oh, that was the only thing I was watching this weekend. And it completely was, was terrible. But the worst so part is it kind of kind of worked out for him. But there were good fights before that, too. I think they were all finishes leading up to that. I mean, Yoel looked uh, looked fantastic. He got his typical third round finish, even though, I mean, did he really get the finish inside of the bell? They called it 459. Looked like 501. Uh, <laughs> it was a gift of a TKO. It was a gift one. of a TKO. But but you know what? Hey, kudos to him because it probably should have been stopped a little earlier. Real, real, reasonably could have been. And we wouldn't argue it at least. He was he was touching him up hard. Lorenz Larkin looked good. I mean, these were fights that got lost in the shuffle. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I was I was literally cage side at PFL at that point. Mm-hmm. You know, um, watching those fights get started, and that's just how it, how it goes sometimes when all these promotions just feel like, hey, we got to do everything on you know Cinco de Mayo weekend. Uh, and and the worst part, like here's here's just from my perspective, right? So you're covering it in the, on the micro level, and you guys have everything. Me just covering for the post. I did a few interviews with with UFC. I had some stuff going on from UFC content wise. Uh, it was a busy week for just me, and then I also had a Q and A with Anthony Pettis. I'm thinking, okay, 
I want to cover. I want to get one of these. I don't think I can. I didn't really have enough time to get everybody right. So covered PFL. I got Anthony Pettis. We had a Q and A, and it is. And I'm not getting numbers necessarily because I'll probably get in trouble for that. But it is definitely and easily the least read thing that I have ever done for the New York Post. It just got completely lost, and it's disappointing because I yeah. think it's a good one. See, like that's what I was saying, man. There's it can be the best content in the world, and it's just like on weeks like this, it just does not matter. Yeah, <laughs> just does not matter unless if it's literally the headliner that you know makes something crazy happen. It's true. They they you know need I mean? that, and 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 nothing crazy happened in either of the PFL or Bellator headliners. Both of them were were duds. No. Oh my god, that's so unfortunate. <laughs> Everybody was expecting Kayla to just go steamroll, and it was just not that at all. I will say I expected that too. Um, Dan, you probably expected it as well, right? Yep. But I will say I had heard of Mutnatkinim for a few years before. Like before, I kind of knew that she wasn't just a tomato can, so I didn't know that she'd go the distance. But I knew that she wasn't just kind of that like, where? Why is this girl here? You know, there was there was some some credentials to her. So I, I'll give yeah, her credit she, for she that. Yeah, she can hang for sure, and she proved she it can too. Hang. All right, that's enough though. We we got we've got these rounds to get into. Uh, go, going to contested rounds here, Dan. We have to start with, unfortunately, the worst fight title fight in UFC history. Carlos Barza, Rose Namajunas. The scores are forty nine forty six, forty eight forty seven, and then the other way for Rose forty eight forty seven as well. Rounds one and three are split. So <laughs> set up round one. Dan. Yeah, let's let's uh, yeah, might as well get this terrible fight out of the way. <laughs> this won't call, this won't take long though. Uh yeah, non, so like no one's landing anything. Uh, I wish I could add more to it, but basically Esparza lands three three strikes. Rose lands like three strikes. I score it for Rose based on the visible damage uh, to the face, and that's really all I got, 10-9 Rose. Yeah, I so when I watched this first time, I had just about every round the opposite of what I really ought to have. I don't know what was going on with me Saturday night, but my scorecard was like, just throw it in the trash. It was pretty terrible. Um, but I watched rounds one and three especially again today. And I do feel like I'm going to flip from where I originally had Carla to Rose. And, and I think the reason is, yeah, at least that that kind of that jab that kind of touched her on the forehead. I thought that probably was a little bit more meaningful and effective and impactful than the only thing that really stands out for Carla is is that leg kick. Right. She lands like one memorable leg kick mm -hmm. to the uh, to the left leg of Rose. And that's like. That is really it. That's how I, I pretty much that was what decided for me the first time. And then I watched it again. I'm like, you know what? Actually, the punch, I think, was better. <laughs> it's a punch versus a kick. This is pretty much the whole round, right? Like, this is what we're really talking about. Just dance around. They were counting feints as their, as their strikes. That was crazy. Yeah, that was goofy. Uh, Matt, what did you think of this one? I mean, it's it's like you guys said. It, like, what can you really go off of? I mean, there was maybe three strikes with, between each of them. And I, I ended up going with. The punch to the head meant more than the kick to the to the calf <laughs> when it was just like them really just dancing around each other for the whole first five minutes. So, you know, if, if you want to say that Carla pressed forward more, I mean, I kind of get that. But at the end of the day, I think you still have to consider the strikes first. And I think the punches from Rose meant more in that round. So you had Rose. Yeah, I had Rose in the first round. Ah, oh, OK. On our, on our little outline, you put it in the in the Carla category. Oh, my bad. Well, that's all right. He's just messing with us here. Yeah, throwing curveballs. Keeping us on our toes. I like it. Uh, so, but yeah, so I, we're, we're all on rows here. What, what I will say, if there was a case for a round to go to the secondary criteria, I don't know if I'd be able to argue against it that hardly. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm with the punch over the kick. So I've heard of officials, like top officials too, who weren't you know not staffing it and that kind of thing. They they said, you know what. You could almost see where they were getting a 10 10 here. And, and this is something like we talk to to judges and, and officials all the time. They never say that they've given out a 10 10 to hear them even start talking about it. That just tells you how much of a uh, of a trash round this really was with nothing happening. So uh, but I'll t I'm, we ended up obviously we're all on the same page here. We all have, see this one now because I flipped uh, for Rose, a same side as Eric Cologne. Uh, the most veteran of the uh, three, well, let's say title fight veteran of these three judges. It was Rick Winter and Brad Frank saw it for Carlos Barza. I can't get mad at them. <laughs> you didn't have anything to yeah. score here. And and especially the way it works, too, if you're sitting cage side in a round like this where nothing happens, what if they just happen to be obstructed when the one strike in the whole round that mattered from either one of them landed? You could totally understand how it go the other way, right? 
Oh yeah, for sure. Hundred percent. Yeah. So, but but 100%. we'll we'll go with Rose. We've had benefit of hindsight and everything. And and Dan, since you and I are both on the same page here, uh, you gonna tell Matt what we call this one? Uh, it's a couchside override. Meow, 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 meow. Making noises. Yeah, I like making noises. <laughs> <laughs> Matt's laughing at me. Oh man. But uh, yeah. So that that was it for that one. Round three. I mean, technically, more happens here, right? By default. They seem to actually want to fight for the first two minutes of this round. Uh, Rose is open up a bit. She landed a couple strikes. Esparza gets a brief takedown with uh, really nothing behind it. You know, then she lands a decent left hand. Then they return to doing what they're they've been doing for the past fifteen minutes, which, which is, is nothing. A whole bunch of nothing. Uh, late in the round, Rose lands a decent one-two, and that's pretty much will put it over the top for me for that. Yeah, uh, I, I went the other way actually. I went with Carla. Um, Again, what are you really talking about here? There's really just not that much to do. Um, but I did see it for as far as I, I, I can get your, your perspective, of course. Dan, Matt, what were you thinking about this one? Yeah, I, I lean as far as, again, like, like kind of like you said as well, like you can't get mad if somebody goes the other way on this round. I, don't, I mean, I'm pretty much on every round in this entire fight, really. Yeah. But I think this, round five is like this, actually kind of clear for Rose. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually kind of feel that way about four as well for as far as, to be honest. Mm. But three. You can, it's what do you favor? Like, do you, do you favor that late combination or do you favor like the takedown attempts? Like, I think that knee on the exit from that takedown that Carla lands gets overlooked as well. Uh, she lands a nice little knee to the body there. Yeah. Like, as they, as they get up. And I think that kind of got overlooked, but that was something that weighed yeah. a little more heavily because, again, I flipped on this one. Yeah. I Every round, I was basically just an idiot the first time. So <laughs> I flipped on this yeah, but one. We're, I mean, at the end of the day, we're still grasping at straws here. Right. Like, yeah. You know, and, and if you want to go, Rose was more effective than the third. I'm not going to argue with you. Like, you can't. Like, there's not much to really argue with it. Yeah. But it's, it was just such, such a close round with not a lot of action. And I really thought that we were going to see the fight turn here because of the way it started. Like Dan kind of mentioned, like they, they looked like they wanted to fight in the third round. It was like, Oh, okay. No, you, you guys really don't No, <laughs> got to stick back to the plan. Go Enough back to the plan. This. No more fighting guys. Yeah. Carla might've whispered. I, hey, I got a wedding. Well, next week. Uh, Dean hey. Thomas was of course speculating about that. <laughs> and actually, th- do you guys remember in this particular round, this is when the uh, the screens went out briefly, right? So it turned like green briefly. Oh, that green so, screen, so there, yeah. What if like 10 things happened in the middle of that, like just during that, and we just missed it, right? <laughs> but that Exactly, we'll never know. That is actually like, for me, that's like a major argument for why you can't put the judges in like a different room like some people like to think about. Like what if there's a technical difficulty and what if the cameras are down for the entirety of a round or like several minutes of a round? You pretty much have to call it a no contest at that point. And that would be terrible for the fighters. So I, I feel like it's it's the technical stuff like that that's going to ever prevent them from being moved into a separate room, at least all of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I'm a fan of, like, if you're going to do anything different with judges, I'm cool with, you know, obviously you have to have the correct tech for this, but giving them some nice soundproofing like headphones that only allows, like, in-ring audio to yeah, if eliminate they get as that. much else as possible. Mm-hmm. I like. I don't mind that. That would be okay. Yeah. It's, it'd be tough to do because that's the type of thing that like you need to make sure is available like across the board, right? It can't just be you know the UFC. I think you know, so I don't yeah, know. It's, it's a pipe dream. Sort it, of thing. it is. I mean, everything's a pipe dream, right? <laughs> but so so Matt and I ended up on the same page with Carla. Uh, Rick Winter was the judge we saw it for. Eric Colonna and Brad Frank had it the same way as you, uh, Dan. And ultimately, we saw it for the winner. Uh, at least Matt and I. Did you end up saying? For, I think you had it for Rose, then, didn't you, Dan? I have no. I didn't score. F- I didn't score two, four, or five. I just scored one and three. You didn't even bother. I didn't watching. Even bother. Sc- I watched it. No, I watched the fight. I don't. Oh, even, you just didn't score. It. I didn't score it, so I don't. I don't even know what what this. I can't even recall the rounds. Well, you know what? You were wiser than than so. uh, than I because unfortunately, uh, we were watching that and thinking, okay, who's winning here? <laughs> I recall the corners more than I recall the actual fight. Sure, sure. Oh yeah, and and uh, Pat Barry was giving some great advice. Yeah. No. Yeah, oh my God. Well, yeah, that was another thing. It, not that this didn't help me get to my score. This helped me validate my score for round one. Mm-hmm. If Pat Barry can see the swelling on on Carlos' face in round one. Obviously, the judges can see it then too. Yeah, I so. would have to think so too. They have they have the best view, of course. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't want to talk about this fight anymore. Can we stop? Yeah, let's, can let's, we just move yeah. on to something else? Enough which is, energy. Uh, which is another terrible fight, honestly. This uh, it wasn't terrible. No, it was I thought not, this was a fun fight. It was okay. It was okay. Uh, Macy Chase on uh, getting the win over Norma Dumont. Uh, split decision here, 30-27 twice, and then 29-28 the other way. Whenever you see that, obviously, you know you kind of have that knee jerk reaction, like. 
what the heck is that judge seeing? But let's kind of, let's let's at least discuss this one. Why are we seeing the split, especially in round one, Dan? Yeah, I think it's a fairly close round. Uh, stronger lands, I think, are definitely coming from uh, Chesson. I'm seeing a lot of misses from Dumas or lands to the shoulder. Nothing really clean. Uh, Chesson's landing a bit cleaner on a hole, uh, and they actually feel harder, uh, especially your left hand. Dumont, of course, she did get a couple that did go through, but just wasn't enough for me. 10-9 chess zone. Yeah, the same way. Saw it the same as uh, Eric Colon and Chris Flores. We, we didn't have as many judges here, too. A lot of the, the top judges ended up flying out to um, Paris. They were working the Bellator fights out there. Why not go to Paris if you can to work, right? Why are you going to Phoenix if you can go to Paris? Uh, I, you were the one who was saying you want to yeah, go to Arizona, I'd right, Dan? go to Arizona. Yeah, you're weird. Actually, one, the one, one of my buddies that I went to Vegas with had a layover in Phoenix on his way home. He had to spend the night there because his flights just kept getting canceled. That's unfortunate. So they should have spent. They should have had a layover <laughs> in Paris. Man, yeah, that would have been probably better. <laughs> um, but yeah, Junichiro Camillo, he's the one who saw it for Dumont. What about you, Dan? Or uh, excuse me, Matt. What did What did you see in this one? In the first round of this one? Yeah. I mean, it was it was it was close, but I, I liked I liked Macy's work a little bit more. I, I like like Dan was kind of saying. I thought she was landing more flush strikes, you know, and it was still it was still a close round, but. I thought I like Macy's, I guess, overall control of the round more. Yeah, I think she was landing more effectively overall. That's definitely where we're at. Um, all agreement here. No, but but again, close round. Round three. This is a little bit of a strange round to be talking about, I feel like, on our show, Dan. What's happening here? Yeah, uh, Dumont cracks Chesson in the first exchange twice with a right hand, and that forces Chesson to grapple. She She almost has the back, but can't keep it down there, you know, so just holds her against the fence pretty much the rest of the round. She's doing these stay busy knees, and I'm sure they probably add up, but I feel they're more cumulative impact strikes than immediate impact, where they're just kind of more annoying. Uh, when they do separate, Dumont cracks her again with a couple more time with good strikes, and then Chesson clinches, resumes her little knees. I like it for Dumont on immediate impact. What about you, Matt? I am the same way. I'm the same way. You know, it was kind of one of those things where it's like, oh, you're a wrestler now sort of thing that we like to talk about, but that's smart strategy for Macy. Because she got cracked, and she was like, "You know what? I can't take another one right now, or I'm gonna, this fight's gonna be over." So she tried to go to the wrestling game, couldn't quite get it there. I mean, she did slow Dumont down, but man, the damage there took that round for me from from Dumont. Absolutely. I mean, the name of the game is is effective striking and grappling, right? What's effective here is is it the fact that she's being held up against the cage and and getting you know these like kind of said annoying knees, or is it those three times where she got cracked? I think it's definitely that. I'm actually pretty surprised that this round went the way it did. I, and especially the fact that the only one who saw it for Dumont, uh, Junichiro Camillo again, he was in the minority here. You know, Eric Colon and Chris Flores, they saw it for uh, Shea Son. And I just don't, I really have trouble seeing this one. I, I don't know if I'm out of line here, Dan. What do you think? Am I, I like crazy or I, what? I, I felt like she was only wrestling because she got smacked in the face hard and didn't like it. And then she was just trying to run the clock out. And she didn't do anything with it. That's the thing. Yeah. Like it, it could be reactionary, but if you can do something with it, all right, fine. She didn't do anything with it. So no, I'm very surprised this one. I, I don't I don't think it's the greatest of scores. Maybe maybe there's a a, a rationale out there that I'm missing, but yeah, I, I don't like this one. So I'm definitely with uh, Dumont here and and Judge Comigio, uh, and we all agree here, which which makes me feel good. And and what does that also make this round, Dan? Another couch side over. And that is it for this fight. I don't want to talk about that fight again. Either that one, I, I want to forget about that one. It just wasn't the greatest fight, you know, especially because of that ending sequence where it's just like you hate to see a fighter just pressed up against the cage and not doing anything, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, that's enough of that. Obviously, we will now go into. I think we can go a little quicker here because we got so many. Ovid Saint Pru got the win over uh, Shogun Hua, of course. Split decision: thirty twenty seven, twenty nine twenty eight, and then a twenty 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 nine twenty eight the other way. We're talking about rounds one and two here, Dan. What's going on in round one? Uh, I think this round is uh, body kicks versus leg kicks. Uh, Shogun's best shots are the inside leg kick, and OSP is landing the body kick good amount of up to the stomach. Uh, Shogun's stomach is all red. I'm going OSP 10-9. I think uh, they were the more immediately impactful strikes. What, what did you see, Matt? See, I, I liked the body kick work from OSP, but I thought I thought Shogun was doing a good job at shucking some of those away. So I was kind of giving him a little bit of defensive credit there for kind of at least recognizing those, whereas OSP was just eating the leg kicks. Like, he wasn't trying to defend those mm -hmm. whatsoever um, for most of them. He defended a couple, like, tried to check a couple. But um, 
close round. I mean, I'm not I'm not mad if you're on Dan's side of things, you know, scoring it that way for OSP. But um, I kind of leaned I leaned uh, Shogun. Yeah, I mean that's the funny thing. Like defense obviously doesn't get scored, but like when you're checking a leg kick, it is different. Like you can actually end up damaging your opponent that way too. So that that's like the type of thing where you actually have to look at it just a little bit, right? Does that make sense, Dan? Yeah, there was something similar we wanted to ask a question about. Like, what if someone hurts their hurts their opponent's hand that gets blocked? Yeah, I guess How that makes that, that makes sense too. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, if you notice it, that's damage. Like that is yeah. effective striking. You know, is it not? You know, it, it it's got to count. Because you think even how long ago was it that Will Brooks just got the uh, the check kick KO right mm. or TKO? It was just a couple weeks ago. I mean, does does that not count unless his opponent lost the fight like it totally should count right it, i think that's effective offense mm-hmm. so yeah I, I think there's something to that i think i think matt's right here um and yeah i i, I ended up seeing it the way of shogun i think this is a very close round I, I i don't think it's anything to get up in arms about either way so i saw it that way judge kamijo once again uh is in the he's the out judge here it was judges uh cologne and winter who saw it the same way as you dan uh with osp so let's go into round two and let's see, because uh, again, we have we have a close fight kind of developing here. What do we see in round two? Yeah, this is a pretty close round. Uh, I think Shogun's landing better to all targets. He starts landing some good good shots to the head, the body. Uh, continued with his leg kicks. Uh, OSP threw some head kicks. I thought they were mostly blocked. And uh, he continued with his body work. I just think who was better all around here. Yeah, I'm with you. Pretty much the same rationale. I, I don't really have much to add to that one. Uh, what about you, Matt? Yeah, that's uh, actually... Uh... I forget. Let me see something real quick. Sorry. Sure, sure. Gonna... I want to say because this was a close, one of those closer rounds as well, where it was like you know either guy could could go like could, could score like you could score the round for either guy, right? You can but, see the um, argument. I, sure. Yeah, I did have the notes for this one. Actually, this was yeah, this is the one I actually scored for OSP. Like I think I this was the one fight out of the entire night where I didn't agree with like any of the official judges, like round by round. Mm-hmm. Um, you had your own score, time, right? Yeah, first first round I went Shogun, second round I went OSP, and third I went OSP, which we'll talk about obviously. But um, yeah, I I liked his front kicks. I thought were more flush in the second round than they were in the first. I thought they landed better in the second round. Um, you know, like Dan was saying, like those front kick work in the first round was was really good. I thought it was better in the second round than it was in the first. Um, and just the hard harder kicks, you know. And then he closed out the round strong with with a nice little uh, series of strikes in the last thirty seconds or so. So that's why I went with OSP in the second. What is funny though is that yeah, Dan, I don't believe ended up seeing it the same way as any one judge either, right? Or you, you saw no, you saw the same way as Eric Cologne. I saw it the same way as Judge Camijo, and then Matt saw it his own way. We all ended up with different final scores too as a result because i'm i think we're pretty much defaulting that we know that osp won the third round that's that's hmm. kind of academic there so very very close fight disheartening to see shogun raise his hands in victory at the end thinking that that was his name being read it, i mean i don't know why ovin sounded like Maurizio, but I, I guess you know you're in the moment you just hear one thing it, it was unfortunate but yeah uh not the greatest visual <laughs> from the pride legend of course Let's move into. <laughs> there's so many split decisions on this card. Shame, shame on the crowd for booing Shogun, though. Oh, How dare yeah, you? absolutely. That that's trash. Like this was this was a trash trash uh, fan base that was in this arena. I'm sorry if you were there. I'm sure there are some people who were, were perfectly fine. There were good people on both sides, right, Matt? Um, but <laughs> but uh, you know what I'm talking about. But. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but but yeah, we had somebody rush the cage. It's like, come on, this is the trashiest things going on in Phoenix, right? Yeah, Phoenix was on their Florida stuff, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, they really were. Uh, but yeah, we we can move into Randy Brown uh, and Cass Williams, which for me, this was a fight I was re- really looking forward to, and I think it kind of delivered on that split decision, twenty nine twenty eight all around. It really just came down to how you saw round three. Uh, so Dan, w- what did we see in round three? I think we saw a pretty clear round. I thought Randy Brown's basically picking him apart, landing hard shots, lands that front kick early, cracking him with uh, hard right hands. Chaos landed three hard right, uh, rights that made me say, okay, those were good. But Brown was far and away the better fighter this round, I think. Outside of that one you know, quick knockdown, nothing happened. I don't think he was all that hurt by it, just got knocked down. I mean, I get it's a big impactful moment, but outside of that, Brown pretty much in class, outclassed him this entire round, I think. It's it's really tricky, right? Because of I mean, you're supposed to weigh the immediate impact more heavily, right? And and I think you pretty much can't argue that there was any one moment that was higher 
than that for Chaos Williams, right? But so that's why you can kind of see at least kind of where it would go the other way. But yeah, I think you're right. I think when you when you add up the the immediate and the cumulative in there and you try to weigh them in, in, you know, whatever way you can. It's very subjective, of course. You kind of have to just figure that out, right? But I think, yeah, I think Randy Brown, really, he did he did enough work effectively landing strikes and landing his impact and doing his offense successfully to be able to take the round. Uh, so I'm I'm with you, Dan. I saw this one as a, as a Randy Brown round. What about you, Matt? Yeah, same. Um, the knockdown for me, it was more like an off-balance thing because it was like he came in and dipped to that side and then that's when he got caught and instead of trying to reset his feet i think he just fell back more than anything i don't think it was like a, i'm a hurt sort of thing it was just like he had nowhere else to go in that moment with where his body was leaning mm-hmm. so he had no choice but to go to the ground and and i think the indication you know really was like how did he react when he got down there well he immediately locked chaos up prevented more damage and then you know sure he, he was there. yeah he, he's he's definitely um uh, not he's not messed up right he's he's not exactly. rocked absolutely that that's a fair point um yeah yeah can't discount that so, so you had it for randy brown yeah i did and then of course you know he gets back up gets that tie clinch starts throwing those knees um or and then the elbow uh to the head against the fence as well so i thought he did overall exponentially you know not exponentially but clear work to win the round outside of that one knockdown that you know a lot of people may have weighed a little bit too heavy Sure, sure. That's fair. I maybe I waited too heavily too, but I ended up on Brown anyway. So we will ultimately end up at the same place, I guess, which is which is a good thing. Uh, I think the right guy won here, uh, which is I mean, Cass Williams looked really good in that first round too. So it just it didn't go his way. I like Cass Williams. I, I really look forward to seeing him again. But it's nice to to see Randy Brown, who's especially you know I'm, I work for the New York Post. He's a local guy for us, so that's always nice to see the local guys win. Um, so we were all on the same page as Chris Lee and uh, Judge Camijo. Rick Winter was the out judge, seeing it for chaos williams but I, yeah i have no problem with it either way to be honest uh cj vergara he got a split decision win over um, oh, i'm gonna say his name wrong again. Ked, kedson uh rodriguez did I, did I get that or did i did i mess that up terribly boys i thought it was Cle- cledson is it cledson? cledson oh did i mistype it yeah that would be why cledson cledson <clears throat> right yeah Clayton Abreu or cledson Abreu. no cledson Abreu is a different guy man yes Ro- rodriguez Rodriguez. <laughs> Split decision, all 29-28s, two for one, one for the other. Round three, once again, is our split round. So, Dan, what happens? Uh, good start for Vergara. His jab lands nicely, snaps the head back, landed a couple big rights, especially a nice uppercut. Rodriguez, he's doing good body work. His kick kicks are finding the target. Uh, they end up on the ground after a knee to the shoulder topples over uh, an already off-balance Rodriguez. So I didn't really put too much to that, especially because it landed to the the shoulder Mm -hmm. and they end up in a scramble where vergara has his back taken but he's so high he's not in any danger but he's also stuck in a calf slicer yeah potentially that's true it doesn't really kind of go for it i don't think he realizes he has a calf slicer because if he did he would have started stomping his other leg and i think he would have had vergara in trouble there and at least at least some pain that he'd have to deal with there i do not Uh, like calf slicers but really (laughs) really that whole thing there was really no danger to vergara uh, because he was so high, his neck was really never in danger. Once they get back on the feet, Vergara's winning the striking in my eyes. It's close as Rodriguez, he's, he's still landing some, but I'm going with Vergara 10-9. Yeah, me too. I, I saw it the same way. It's, it's, it is a close round. Like, you can make the argument, man. Yeah. It, it makes a lot of sense. I, I think there was just something in the water with these fights where they just they all ended up being close for one reason or another. Some of them were, were action-packed. Some of them were, well... Some of them were the strawweight title fight. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm with you and Eric Cologne and Eric Curcio. Uh, the two Eric saw it the same way, uh, judging wise. Matt, did you see it the same way as us or did you see it the other way? I didn't. I saw it the other way with uh, Junichiro. Um, but it was one of those rounds where it was just like, I don't know. It either way feels right to me on mm-hmm. this round because the calf slicer situation was weird because it wasn't like he intentionally got there. It just kind of happened. But he still was able to hold that position there. And I think he did kind of recognize that it was there because the way he kept that right leg tucked under and held it there while he was trying to do stuff up top, even though he wasn't really able to get anything. Mm. I mean, Vergara was even like audibly saying things like he's not doing thing, anything, bro, or whatever. So he felt safe. But I still thought Rodriguez was trying to at least advance where from where he could in that like kind of awkward squir- scramble result position that they were in. Um, so I thought that that was more so effective grappling in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But Vergara did have, he landed some nice strikes as well. So it was one of those things where it just came down. I thought that the grappling meant a little bit more in that round in particular. But if you want to go the other way, I'm not mad at you at all. Like I could probably watch that round again and feel the other way. You know, it's just one of those rounds where it's really, how are you feeling in that moment when you watched it? And that's how I scored it for Rodriguez in the moment watching it. This was this was the one round I watched with no audio. Was Rogan losing his mind? Was he losing for, his mind? I don't potential think. calf slice. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't see. I have no commentary on this. So I don't. I don't I know don't if think, he was getting excited. I think he was or going not. bonkers. No, he wasn't going bonkers, but no. he was definitely. He was definitely mentioning it. Well, he's okay. like he gets excited. Yeah, about he was that talking about it for sure, but he wasn't going like, oh, no. okay. calf slicer. <laughs> like he wasn't doing any of that. <laughs> no. Okay. It's locked in. <laughs> Oh no, no no! That's it for the split decisions. That, we only have four more rounds. Only four more rounds, guys. Yeah, this is a busy one. <laughs> this is such a busy oh. one. Uh, Francisco Trinaldo, Danny Roberts. No one questioned who won this one, of course. Uh, but the scores were all over the place: thirty twenty six, thirty twenty seven, twenty nine twenty eight. So we had two rounds split. The first round uh, is we're, we're questioning who won the round here, Dan. So why are we talking about that? I think it's a really close round. I think both guys are hitting with with some solid power. Robert's left hand when it when it actually splits the guard, I think it's really good. Uh, he was coming up short a couple times, but you know, like when he did land, it was good. Good leg kicks, good kicks to the body. Early Trinaldo landed a, a solid uppercut. I thought he did good work in the clinch. Uh, got into some brawling situations. I thought he landed some good punches in those exchanges. Uh, on the whole, I think Roberts was more effective. Seemed to have Trinaldo more defensive in more exchanges where he would just, you know, cover up and not fire back right away. Uh, but I do think it's very close, but I'm on uh, Roberts 10-9. You see it that way too, Matt? Yeah, I did. I did. I, I think the thing that kind of gets Roberts in trouble at times is his reactions to things. Like, the way he reacts to, like, strikes and trying to, I guess, circle and reset, it doesn't look like he's always, like, it looks, I think he reacts to things, like, bigger than they actually are. You know, sure. Just like his his movement seems a little awkward at times. I mean, maybe it's just the awkward movement, and judges can kind of see that in a negative light. Like they think, oh, that shot must have really hurt. And like, no, nah, I think that's just how he moves. You know, and you really, I don't know if there's a a perfect way to correct that. You know, to kind of convince judges that that punch didn't hurt me as much. You know, it's just one of those weird things. And you, you but know, yeah, you, I, was, I was with Roberts in the first. You mentioned that too. I mean, you're talking about the reactions. There's there's one point I think it is in this round where Roberts. Uh, I mean. Trinaldo lands a, a I forget it was I, mean, I want to say it was a right hand and Roberts kind of reacts like yeah you got me kind of thing he did this little like gesture thing and that's you just can't do that like you have to have a bit of a poker face when it comes to this if you're trying to get the judges on your side that's that is that is a more important thing than let's say getting the late takedown to steal the round <laughs> you that one doesn't make any sense but this one tracks like you really do want to put on a good face put on a good poker face let the judges not think you got landed on, because then they're not going to think about that strike that just landed as much. They, they're, it's not like reactions of the be all end all. It, you know, good judges can sometimes even pick it up, right? There's there's visible damage that's left behind and all that. But if you're if you're saying, oh, didn't hit me, they know it hit you. <laughs> you Could don't do that had otherwise. Too good of a poker face. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, but but yeah, I actually ended up seeing it for Trinaldo. I think his work uh, more in the early part of this round was, I think, where he was most effective. Uh, and I just I didn't think necessarily that Roberts was able to get over the hump in that round. But again, really close. I, I don't have a problem with it going either way. So uh, I was I saw it the majority of the way with uh, Judges Camillo and Flores. You guys saw it with Eric Colon. And unfortunately, Matt, there is no couch side override. It has to be Dan and I because we're the hosts. You're the guests. Oh. Just the way it works. <laughs> All good. You'll have to get over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he cares. Uh, round two, though, we're not talking about who won. We're talking about 10-8 situations, sir. Dan, what? why are we talking about it? Yeah, well, I definitely think there's damage there. Huge damage. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's checked pretty solidly. But ultimately, Trinaldo let him off the hook. Uh, he hits him early, and that, that's where Robert starts short-circuiting. That was a really weird reaction. Uh, and then he gets smashed in the face again, hurt to the body, gets stuck in a guillotine, and he escapes. And then Trinaldo kind of just hangs out on top for a while. Some random intermittent ground and pound. No real sense of urgency to finish. Gets back on the feet. Robert just fighting back. Lands a couple decent shots, I thought. Uh, I think the only reason Trinaldo doesn't get a 10-8 from me is because he doesn't really check duration. He, he's kind of just chilling out, not pushing for the finish. If he pushed a little harder, I could I could probably get there. Um, but all I got really is damage, and I don't think he was all that diminished because he was let off the hook. So 
Yeah, and and you know what? You kind of talk about that off the hook kind of thing. That reminds me of something that Dan and I, of course, have been told a few times by judges and, and by several judges that, you know, did they earn the eight or did the other one earn the nine, you know? did Was there enough done on the other side to kind of get that score back, right? And I think because Roberts does have that kind of late success in the round because for a while it's not looking like it i i don't i don't know if i could have gone for the the nine here i think i was leaning toward the eight for a little while but ultimately because roberts is able to it's not just that you have to show something but he showed some good amount of of success here and i think he was able to get it back because the damage while good it wasn't like he was like on the verge of being like finished several times or something like that i think it was something that was able to be overcome so that's why i ended up seeing it the same way as you dan for the nine what about you matt yeah i I agree with you guys i think he started off very strong he had that big moment to where it was like a 10 eights possible if not an outright finish but like dan said he let him off the hook he started slowing down and then you know and we see him get back to his feet and start having some some offense there so it was it was weird that Ternaldo. i mean maybe it's an age thing dude's 43 years old maybe he just like hey I'm just gonna hang out, hang out down here for a little bit. <laughs> He's um, never had much of a killer instinct. He's never had much killer instinct in him, though. Yeah, you know, it's it's weird because I thought he really could have finished the fight there, and he just didn't go all out. You know, at least get the TKO stoppage, not not an outright KO, but mm-hmm. just start wailing on the guy. But maybe he was just trying to conserve. I don't know how tired he was in that moment or what, but yeah, he definitely let him off the hook there. And not so only that's great. Not ten o- nine for me. Not only that, Matt. He's coming up. I mean, this isn't his first fight at welterweight, but he was a he was a lightweight for a very long time. So come up fifteen pounds. The the power differential there is it's it's noteworthy. So you know maybe someone like Roberts can take it a little better than say you know, I'm trying to think of who he finished down there uh, recently. Who who was the one he finished a couple years ago? The uh, oh goodness, I think it was a, he was an Englishman or an Aussie. Uh, either one of you, if you can remember, it was during the pandemic. Someone oh goodness, it's bothering me. Lerone Murphy. No, was not him. We will not come up with this. I, I don't want to slow down the show, but <laughs> but ultimately, yeah, we all ended up seeing it at 10-9 for Trinaldo. Same as uh, Judges Colon and Flores, and it was uh, Judge Comedia who had the eight here. Eh? Look, I, I don't hate pushing for more eights. I actually really like it. I just I don't think it really hit it by the way that kind of the standard is being set right now. So that's that's I think where we all basically ended up. And uh, the next fight, though, now there's, now we're talking about another eight case. And I think this is probably our stronger one uh, that Dan will get into. And it was Lupe Godinez uh, in round two, putting it on Ariane Conolasi. She got two 10 eights here, 30 26s and one 30 27. So why is this? A potential 10-8, sir. Yeah, Loopy rocks her on the feet with punches and takes her take her straight to the ground. It's one-way traffic the whole round. She has damage, dominance, and duration. Carnalosi's defensive the whole time. Overwhelmed by the transitions and the grappling. Eating ground and pound. Defending subs. A really solid arm triangle attempt at the end. I think she, she was pushing hard for a finish. And I think she earned eight. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I think she really got here this time. This is this is one where you just don't see a whole lot of traffic coming back the other way from Carnalossi and and you got the dominance, you got the damage, you got the duration. I think it's pretty much there. You know, is there a borderline case in in one of those? I don't know. I I, I don't necessarily see it that way. I think I think you can solidly check it here. I'm I'm going with the eight. Uh, what about you, Matt? Oh, a hundred percent, hundred percent going with the eight on this one. Um, just sheer dominance. Like that's that's should be the textbook. This is what a 10-8 round looks like. <laughs> I mean, Amen. the fact that the fact that one that Chris Flores gave a 9 is is just criminal to me. I think it's 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 a tough thing right now when we're talking about the 8s and 9s, the de- the definition of these has gotten so screwed up in the last year or so. Ever since Israel Adesanya and Jan Blahovic, we talk about this round all the time on this show, uh, Matt, but that particular fight led to Dana White saying you need to have uh, have an ass whooping, right? An ass kicking. That's that's what the 10-8s were when I was coming up, you know, back in my day stuff. And <laughs> it, he, he totally ruined it. He ruined everything that was good about the 8s for a while. And and it's just, it's all out of whack. The commissions have, have kind of put down that whole, like, you know, really, you, you need it to be like that now. So... It's. I think it's screwed everybody up, and that's unfortunate. So I try not to go crazy about it. But this is a round that really felt like an eight. It really felt like it wasn't going to be that hard to give. I, I think I'm with you, Matt. Yeah, it's it's crazy to me how you can have a round like this, like in the second round, be judged the same as the first. Yeah, exactly. There there needs to be a different. I, I I've been saying this lately. I, I think I like to call it this. It's a different round. I feel like when a round is just different than that first 
round and you can't just do it in fight right it has to be consistent across all the fights but we can look at first round and then we can look at the second round and we know that something different happened there and that it ought to be scored differently and i think that's the way you get results more accurately reflecting what happens in these fights you know this to have everything be a nine that doesn't tell you what happened and and you're sometimes you're gonna end up with scores that it just doesn't feel fair that somebody won you know that's where the 10 point must system just kind of doesn't live up to where it should be so i get frustrated with it too but ultimately again we were all on the same page didn't even matter because loopy totally crushed her she was up at that point at least 2017 uh and then it didn't matter what happened in that third round uh by the way just real quick how high do you think uh loopy godina's ceiling is matt Oh, very, very high championship quality. I'm with you, Matt. Very uh, soon. I think we'll see that very soon, too. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. She, she wants to fight all the time, right? She, she'll probably be back in there in a couple of weeks. Uh, My Dan, kind of fighter. Your kind of fighter, Dan. Yes. I mean, where do you see her ceiling? I hope she wins the belt. Yeah. I, I hope I, I'll, I'll root for her until she starts saying, no, nah, I don't want to fight. I only want to fight once a year, twice a year. There's something about her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's not her. It's, it's the UFC. You know this. No, he's, no Dana said. I love it when guys ask to fight a lot. But they don't want their champions fighting all the time because they have to pay them he more. He said Alex is da- he wants Alex to fight three times this year, Falkanovski. I'm sure he does, but he doesn't want him to fight four times. I'll, I'll accept Because then he three. fights out the contract too quickly, and then he's got to pay him more. That's not fun. All right, I'll accept three. <laughs> you will accept it. Very nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I see championship caliber. She reminds me of, of all the things that were really good about Tatiana Suarez, right? Different, different fighter. They're not the same, but there's there's a similarity to, into the way they kind of they just go after it, right? And I hope that she can kind of realize some of the potential. I hope I hope Suarez can come back and do that too. You know, I'm still rooting for her to make it back. That would be an amazing comeback story, right? You and me both, man. Oh yeah. my god, I hope she can come back and still be the same type of fighter, if not better. I mean, even just to get back would be kind of a a, a victory in and of itself, right? Last yeah, that would be huge, last... especially because so, so much time she's been off, man. Yeah. Oh, and, and with so many different things. Ugh. Awful. Uh, one more round here. We're, we're finally here, guys. Journey Newson got the win over Fernie G- Garcia. This was the curtain jerker. Two 30-27s and a 29-28. We're only talking about that first round uh, and who won it. So, Dan, what happens here? Uh, close round. Uh, feels like Garcia is doing his best Rose and Carla impression for the first minute and a half. <laughs> Setting the tone? Yeah, just didn't, didn't really fight. Uh, Newson landed some sweet chin music early, uh, but unfortunate for him, he's not HBK, so it wasn't over. Didn't get the knockout. And then he lands the hook kick to the head. Uh, and then when every time Newsom comes into boxing range, Garcia actually does let his hands go. And they're, they're fast punches. I just don't think many are actually getting through. I think a lot are being blocked. Uh, Newsom didn't have that much also throughout this round. He does land a nice hard leg kick at the end of the round. I think Newsom wins a close one. But uh, uh, 10-9, I, I, I won't argue too uh, hard for it. Yeah, I actually did go the other way. I went for Garcia, and you're right. He's in the first in the first couple of minutes. There's really just not that much happening. He's definitely waiting for his opportunities. But I do I I didn't see them blo- getting blocked as much as you did. Maybe I'm wrong. That's fine. But I I did see the at least from my view, it certainly looked like that the hands were doing a little more uh, effective work than what we were seeing from Newsom. But really close round. It was very hard for me to to kind of go the other way and or, and, or not go the other way. I guess. Did, am I crazy here, Matt? What do you think? No, you're not crazy. I mean, it was a close round, but I was I don't know. If I, I guess I was a little bit more critical of this fight in general just because Bernie Garcia is a Fortis guy and I you know spent oh, some yeah. time in that gym being here in Dallas. So I was I was really critical. I was I think I was kind of looking at that fight like through Coach Safe's eyes and he was he would not not happy at all about mm-hmm. what was happening. So I I guess I kind of weighed the effectiveness of of Journey News and a little bit more critically, maybe than I possibly should. If mm-hmm. I go back and watch it, I'll probably feel the same way. But I thought, I thought Journey's work in the first round was was a little bit better. Yeah, I think it's fair, and I don't know. Of course, it's the first round. First round, you definitely want to get right. So, but ultimately, it did not matter because the other two rounds ended up definitely going Journey's way. Um, you guys saw it for the majority with judges Camillo and Chris Lee. I saw it the same way as Brad Frank. Didn't matter. And we are finally through all these rounds, guys. We made it. Congratulations to all of us. Let's uh, <laughs> through through all sorts of technical difficulties and things. Everybody's dropping out. Everyone's internet's going out. The Russians are attacking or something like that. Who knows? Um, <laughs> we are here. Uh, now we're at the part, which is the fun part, the favorite finishes. We had four finishes in the UFC overall, two KO, two sub, three were in the first round. Bellator. We're going to throw Bellator and PFL in here, just the main cards. Four on Bellator's main card, finish-wise. All TKOs or KOs. Two were in the first round. PFL, three finishes, all in the first round. 
two subs, and a TKO. Let's start with our guest. You had a lot of choices here between these uh, these brands. What was your favorite? I mean, KO of the year, obviously. <laughs> yeah, obviously, it's like, there. You know, I'm not I'm not even going to attempt to go hipster on you guys on this one. Like it's <laughs> it's obvious. Michael Chandler just sending Tony Ferguson into the deepest, darkest parts of the shadow realm with that front kick. Just incredible stuff. Yeah, it's, it's you know what? It's not. Don't go hipster. That's fine. But do you have a second choice? Hmm. To be honest with you. I don't. I didn't even think about a second choice. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's this was, fair. This was good enough to be the top five, like all five. Uh, that's like, fair. Just from different angles, different camera angles of the same knockout. <laughs> sure, sure. No, I get it. I get it completely. I, I, I would say I will throw in there uh, the finish that we got from Charles Oliveira, if as would probably be my second choice because it just the way he was attacking the subs and setting up things and pouncing when he had the opportunities to because obviously he's kind of you know he's looking for for that arm first. Uh, and then obviously he doesn't quite get it. And all of a sudden there's a quick opening and he just pounces on the back and is going to like, you knew when he had that back, you knew it was already over before the choke was in. Uh, it's just beautiful work from a beautiful technician. I tell you what, one thing I noticed about that transition, it looked like he was going to try to wrap up the right arm of Gaethje with his left leg and then immediately abandon it. It's, it's like a split second. Mm -hmm. Like, I really think that that was one of those things where he's like, he could have wrapped up that arm and gone for like a crucifix sort of thing and like started raining elbows from the back or mm -hmm. something. But it was just like a split second there where his leg was in position for it and then immediately just wrapped it around all the way around, like super lightning quick, super high level stuff. I mean, the guy has options, right? He's got a billion <laughs> options. Yeah. I mean, he was looking for that. Arm. I thought he was going to get the arm. I really did. I thought ultimately he was working for it and it would just happen. Uh, but fortunately for him, he had other opportunities. And look, you don't want to be in a scramble with this man, especially when he's already got the advantage. You're not going to win it. Uh, I think Unless we saw Jim that. Miller. Jim, well, all right. Jim Miller from 12 years ago, sir. Yes. I still finished him. I know. I understand. The My kid sub. The kid had just turned 21. Hey, wins a win. Or 22 or whatever he was at that point. He was he was a, just a child. Uh, and they threw him into the through the wolves way too early. I've I've been beating that drum for a while that Charles Oliveira got way in over his head way too quickly. He was not protected by you know his coaches, his management, the UFC, whoever it was that allowed these things to happen. They kind of did the Aaron Pico before Aaron Pico, uh, in in some ways. Uh, the fact that he's where he is, I think, is just a testament to not only his skill but that mental fortitude that he has to have worked through a very rough stretch of his career. It would have been very fair five years ago to look at Charles Oliveira and say, this is a journeyman. His record was 10 and eight. What are you going to say about that? No, you know, no one's looking at him being like, he's finally going to do it. Even if you see the talent there, it's so hard to call it at that point, but he saw it. Not a quitter. I don't care what Justin Gaethje says. He is not a quitter. He's everything. Not a quitter. Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> A little intense about that one? Sorry. Yeah. Calm down. <laughs> what was your favorite, man? Uh, well, I called this one early before That's true. UFC even started. And he told me I couldn't not. I was stuck with it. You so. are stuck with it, but it's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah, Anthony Pettis mounted triangle. That was uh, that's where it's at. Look, you know, you don't mess around with Anthony Pettis on the ground. Everyone thinks of the Showtime kick. Everything's about the, the Taekwondo and all that. That's his base. But, dude, dude has way too many submissions for us to ever discount him there. <laughs> Who did he tap out? Who has he tapped out in his career? Oh, but yeah, Benson from guard. That was pretty sick. Yeah, double arm guillotine. That was freaking crazy. So slick. <clears throat> my, my favorite part about that that submission was that the way Benson just hopped up and acted like the fight was still on. Like, <laughs> like he was like kind of just like bouncing around in place. Like he didn't even just tap out and lose. Yeah. He and like, was, he just, did he have he the, the title, bro? Did he have the toothpick in his mouth? I don't remember. I don't remember if it was still in there, but just the way he bounced up and was like just kind of like avoiding the belief that he just lost. <laughs> but, but you know, I wasn't even talking about that one. I was talking about someone else who he tapped out. Someone who I was just going on about how awesome he is. Charles Oliveira. Mm. Oh, yeah. Beat yeah, him yeah. by guillotine choke. I mean, he he has, I mean, we saw this meme kind of circulating a little bit uh, a couple weeks ago. He's tapped out Charles Oliveira and he knocked out Wonder Boy. No one else is doing that. That's that's an impressive feat. So kudos to Pettis. Um that is it for this one. That's it for the past. Let's real quick before we kind of let everything go and, and Matt gets going and we all go to sleep at some point. Uh, <laughs> it's getting late. Uh, UFC Vegas 54. Are we 54? I, I forget what number I think it's we're 54. At. Yeah, whatever. 54 uh, is Saturday. Jan Bohovic and Alexander Rakic are 
the headliner here. I don't know how you guys feel about this. Is this like a good headliner for a fight night? Okay. Where, where do you guys stand? It could be good. <laughs> well, could or could not. Change. But like, do you like it? I mean, are you interested? I like Jan. I like, I like Rakic. I mean, last time Rakic was in a headliner, it wasn't that exciting, right? No, it was not. With Tiago Santos, right? Uh, is that what? It... No, well, the one I'm thinking of, at least the one I'm thinking of, is Anthony Smith. Wasn't okay. that a headliner or was that not a headliner, Matt? Uh, Anthony Smith. I want to say that was. Yeah, I think that was. It was not a good fight. It was. it was not a good fight. Yeah. Either way. But what do you think? I mean, is this a fight you like? I, I like the fight. I do like the fight. I like the matchup. But I mean, if you if you're asking me if it's going to be the most entertaining fight in the world, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, it'll be solid. that's where we're at uh, odds, right? Because yeah. it's like it's a it's a fight that totally makes sense for the division, but it's also one that's like, do I really want to see it? Exactly. Like it's, it's one of these fights that yeah, I do want to see it. But will I rewatch it? Will mm-hmm. I have a lot to talk about after the fact? Probably not. Yeah, you might not. Uh, what do you guys, do? You guys have predictions on this? Do you like make predictions, Matt? Yeah, I do. All right, I've got? actually not made my our official predictions for this week yet. I usually do it like on Tuesday or Wednesday. But, oh, you don't have to lock um, in, but where, where are you leaning right now? I'm kind of leaning more so towards Jan, but yeah. it's uh, not terribly confident in it right now. You know, I haven't really sat down and kind of studied it. I usually give these a little bit, a little bit of study, like not too much time to, before I make my picks because I do want to try to win that championship staff pick. There you go. <laughs> the the is, there, is there a trophy? But uh, Yeah. You know, we get our little little trophy icon next to our name on the on the staff sheet oh very nice that's lovely you know, i'm trying to creep up that ladder but i mean <laughs> yeah I'm not, I'm not terribly confident in yon but i think wreckage can very well get it done so i'll have to sit down and study it a little bit more before mm-hmm. i feel confident where do you feel uh dan are you where are you at uh, i have no idea uh cool i'm gonna go racket no decision. one has any thoughts i'm gonna go racket's decision <laughs> that's what i'm thinking you know what spur the moment i'm i'm going to specifically not make any pick okay. and i'm gonna stick to my guns here no pick <laughs> all right no pick. draw right. draw <laughs> draw is making a comeback no contest is doing really well lately i don't know if you guys noticed this but <laughs> we've been seeing a lot more success from no contest uh we're in nevada we'll, we'll have hopefully a return to actually like kind of the, the the more top judges that we have we won't there won't be split we won't have as many arizona judges not that i don't think the arizona judges overall did poor honestly this weekend i think they had a rough one with so many close how many fights did we talk about that were like man this round is really close you know so I, I and anyone who had to work that title fight, my goodness, like just kudos to, for getting through that fight. And they were on the same page on three of those rounds. That wasn't easy. That was not an easy fight to judge. No. Anyone else interested in some of these other fights on the card? I don't know if anything jumps out at you guys. Uh, why don't we start with our guest here uh, as well, Mr. Wells? What do you got? I'm interested in the co-main for me. That's that's about it. Yeah. Um, just because I want to see how Ryan Span. Uh, comes out there and responds again another Fortis guy so I'm kind of biased but yes you are <laughs> and looking for that. that's yeah right. um I mean I think this is a card where we're looking at I think the main event's going to go to decision I think obviously Shikagi and Rebus is going to go to decision for sure so yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> you know it's one of those things where it's like we're we're in for some some judging action <laughs> for sure on this card I think you're right um, any Angela Hill fight is almost guaranteed to go three rounds with controversy with controversy <laughs> But that's the thing. The the thing is, straw weight in particular is absolutely statistically the hardest fight to judge because they throw more strikes, except in this, again, title fight, they throw more strikes with less power than any other division. So it's like, how do you register the impact off of that? It gets much harder as you go down. So the the sweet spot, and I don't know if you know this, Matt, but so I've done, I've done a good amount of like data crunching, right? And statistically, the judges have the easiest time as far as getting on the same page in the middle division. So we're talking about 55 and especially 170. That's where you're least likely to see them split. Okay. That's interesting, the data. Because like if you if you had asked me to guess that, I probably would have guessed 55 to 170. Yeah. But that's interesting that the data aligns with that. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I would say I am interested in that Hill fight against Janji Doba. Uh, Am I saying that? I always, I always know. I never know if I'm saying that one right. Janderoba, Janji Doba. You hear a billion things, but uh, I, I like that one. I do like watching Angela Hill fight. I think she's always interesting, and at the very least, you always know you're going to talk about who won the fight at the end. So there's that. Um, and I do like Amanda Hibas. I'm not saying she's going to win. I don't think it's a good matchup for her. I think the size of Chukagian alone is going to make it really no, tough. But it's, it's, it's death taxes in Chukagian by decision. That's what it is. <laughs> well, except for you know against a certain one. Unless unless it's a title fight. Yeah. In or or Andrade. But other than that's that. true. Well, we're talking about two transcendent women. Um, 
Andrade in particular, like she's going to go down as a goat, but she may never end up with a belt again, except for that one fight, right? With the slam that, that obviously is something, but it's like, she never really had a title run yet. Well, maybe she can. I don't know. Star going to be really tough. It's, it's very clogged right now. So we'll say, uh, anything else for you, Dan? Uh, Nick Maximov and Andre Petrovsky, just okay. because it's going to be, uh, if you like grappling, I think, uh, that's what you're going to get in this one. Sure. That's fair. Uh, and that one, I think, opens the card. Is that right? As of now. I, who knows how it can change by Saturday. Oh, that's right. Tra- yeah, I guess the UFC hasn't really released their their bout order. This, that was just what I think I saw in Tapology. Yeah, tap, yeah, it was Tapology's uh, curtain jerker. It's yeah, it's all we got, right? Um, and that that is it. That is our show. Matt, I, I hope you had a good time. I hope you didn't mind all the uh, the technical glitches that we had to deal with. No, no, that's <laughs> no problem at all. Trust me. I, I, I've ran old podcast back in the day where we've had to completely redo episodes because <laughs> files got corrupted or you know connection like could not come back so it happens <laughs> and, now, and now as you say that i'm like looking over at the soundboard over there i'm like are we recording dan are we recording yeah. we are recording hey yeah. we're, we're good we're in the books <laughs> matt before you go any uh any projects you want to shout out anything you got going on I, or, or social I mean, media just, handles all that yeah at mr m wells on twitter um follow me there if you're not already i appreciate it um but yeah just follow all the good work that myself and the guys do over at mma junkie we are constantly working on a bunch of different stuff behind the scenes and also wrestling junkie if you're pro wrestling fans wrestling junkie just launched this week as well so if you're a fan of pro wrestling please bookmark that site start visiting follow the twitter as well we're trying to grow something from the ground up over there with that so that should be a fun little project too i am not a wrestling guy i haven't been for 20 years but dan you do watch mainly AEW. um WWE here and there, but I'll check that Very out. Very cool. I actually completed uh, recently uh, a rewatch of the Attitude Era, Matt, uh, start to finish. Because I, when I first watched, you know, when we were all kids, uh, I I picked up in '99, like right around the time Mick Foley won the belt, right. So that's kind of that that gives you a peek into when I jumped in. So I missed like that '98 year with Stone Cold. So going back and watching it, it was like. Pretty much any time Stone Cold hit a stunner, I just like geeked out. It was just hilarious and fun and everything like that. And then, man, there were some low points, uh, especially in those first couple years that just would not fly on television today. Uh, Stuff that would get WWE absolutely canceled. <laughs> oh yeah, one hundred percent. It was it was cringe at, at a lot of points, and I'm like, I'm not really enjoying this part. But if, if finally they got at least closer to the stuff that I remember, there was still terrible stuff, but it was a little less. Um, Let's say it was less racially terrible, at least as it got a little farther along. <laughs> that was uncomfortable. Uh, but ultimately, it was it was a fun time. I just don't think it's sparking anything for me to watch wrestling again. But that's fine. Anyone who watches it, you should follow the uh, the coverage on Wrestling Junkie. I would agree. And that is our show, Dan. Uh, thank you once again to Matt Wells for joining us. Uh, we'll be back again next week at our normal day, I assume. Unless, are you planning any more trips, Dan? I'm not going away this weekend, no. All right, good. That'll be good. We'll be on time. Thanks for listening, everybody, and we will catch you next week. Take care, everyone. <laughs>